Welcome to the NYU Tandon School of Engineering and our last seminar of fall 2019. Our series has proven to be an important and informative venue unifying scientific communities around the influential research ideas of today that can have impact tomorrow. The series aims to bring together researchers and students to discuss recent advances in artificial intelligence and related fields. We hope that the scientific discussions that result from this series will contribute to building a better tomorrow and promote groundbreaking discoveries in science. I would like to thank Dean Yelena Kovacevic and Chair Ivan Selesnik, as well as my entire Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering for supporting the, the series and graciously hosting our esteemed speakers, all of whom are world-renowned experts whose research is making an immense impact on the development of new machine learning techniques and technologies. In the process, they are helping to build a better, smarter, more connected world. I would like to extend many thanks to Rachel Thompson, my right hand, and our media team, Kathleen Hamilton, Sandra Ordonez, Mary Reek, Carl Greenberg, Althea Labra, Sheldon Smith, Ingrid Redmond, Elena Olivo, and all those who helped me in organizing this extraordinary event. I'm proud that joining us today is Raya Hatzel, the head of robotics research at Google DeepMind. And organization, an organization dedicated to developing safe, ethical AI technologies for widespread public benefit and scientific discovery. DeepMind programs have learned to diagnose eye diseases efficiently, to keep data centers cool using substantially less energy, and to predict the complex 3D shapes of proteins, which holds the potential to transform how drugs are invented, among other such accomplishments. Raya followed a somewhat unconventional path to her current position. So if you think that it's necessary to learn coding in middle school in order to one day conduct high-level computer science research, you'll find her story edifying. She initially aspired to be a marine biologist, an aspiration that was dashed when she got to college and promptly flunked her intro to biology course. So she turned instead to religion and philosophy. You might be thinking that's what we all do when we flunk a class, but in Raya's case, she actually earned her undergraduate degree in philosophy and religion from Reed College. Ultimately, she pivoted to computer science, looking for a way to devise real-world solutions to society's problems. She attended NYU and earned her doctoral degree under Turing Prize laureate Jan Lacan, whom we were lucky enough to hear during our 2018 series, by the way, and who in fact has joined us today, and he's sitting here. Many <laughs> brava to Jan, and congratulations. <laughs> With a thesis on learning long-range vision for off-road robots. She conducted postdoctoral research at Carnegie Mellon's Robots Institute, where she worked with yet another of our previous series speaker, Marshall Hubbard, and then became a research scientist in Division and Robotics Group at SRI International. Since 2014, she has been a researcher at DeepMind, where her work draws upon principles and fundamentals derived directly from neuroscience. Raya will be speaking today about the need to develop more sophisticated learning systems in order to address complex real-world tasks and the challenges for deep reinforcement learning in complex and constrained environments. Before giving her the stage, I would like to invite you to the next semester seminar series. In spring 2020, we'll be hearing from Jan Kautz, Vice President of Learning and Perception at NVIDIA, Gabor Lugosi, Research Professor at the Department of Economics at the Pampa Fabra University, Nicolo Chasabianchi, Professor of Computer Science at the University of Milan, and Robert Shapiri, Partner Researcher at Microsoft Research and Princeton University Professor. We hope you will be joining us then. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Raya to the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. It was a lovely introduction. Not everybody gets to hear that I flunked intro to bio. Uh, <laughs> But it's good to um, you know, be vulnerable in these cases. Um, and I did go back my senior year, retake it, and get an A, just to set the record straight. Um, right, yes, I'm Rai Hadzel. Um, I'm the director of robotics at DeepMind. Uh, I also lead a research team um, as part of our, our broader deep learning research group there. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you to, today about challenges for deep reinforcement learning in complex environments. I hope you've enjoyed the pointless robot. So first, I'm going to start with a bit of a digression. Um, IID data is something that machine learning is, is founded on. 
right? This is what we assume, this is what we aspire to, this is what we uh, try to achieve when we train our models. Um, uh, but IAD data, independent, uh, identically distributed data, is a strange concept, or at least learning from it. So, you know, think about um, learning biology uh, and grabbing a handful of pages from random sections in the book, shuffling these all together, and learning on them together. This is not how we learn at all. It, it's maybe even more obvious if you think about all of the different classes that you might take as a, a, a um, middle school student, as my son is. Um, you know, you might be uh, able uh, be learning at the same time in school, but in different courses um, about the Russian Revolution, um, themes in Shakespeare, uh, law, laws of logarithms, uh, declensions in Latin. They still teach Latin in uh, the UK, I've found. Um, five pillars of Islam, the periodic table, all of these things, uh, but not shuffled together and sampled IID. We don't learn in that way. We can't learn in that way. Occasionally, we try to test students this way, right, by giving them a test with lots of different questions sampled from across the curriculum, but that's not how we learn. Um, so, so what is, what is the, the, the point of this? Um, well, human learning does best by relatively prolonged inspection um, and consideration of a single subject at a time. If we're going to learn about mushrooms and become an expert in mushrooms, we work on this for a while. We don't take different samples. We learn all about it so that we can learn in the context of all of the different aspects of mushroom science. I'm sure that there's a name for this, mycologist. Is that it? Um, you know, British history. We're not going to try to sample from this. We're going to learn it thoroughly. We're going to learn it by starting with some of the easy stuff, making it a little bit simpler, then making it harder and harder, learning all of the details before eventually becoming an expert after hours, days, years of study. I will even put up a, a model zoo up here um, because indeed that's how we learn to become experts in our own field as well is by deep understanding of all of the different aspects, um, the, 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 the different pieces of a larger subject. So what does this mean? What I think this means is that if in machine learning, we could start to learn a little bit more in this way as well, by being able to learn multiple subjects, but each one deeply and with consideration, with sort of immersing ourselves in that one subject, but yet still being able to learn other subjects as well, we might have a very powerful way of doing machine learning that goes far beyond what we can do now, where we need to uh, sample things and bring them together and present them from a data set uh, so that we can be sure uh, that they are IID, in fact. Um, and here note that I'm not talking about uh, uh, cherries or cakes. Um, I'm not talking about how the models that we're interested in are, are trained and where that supervision comes from. So I'm not thinking about whether or not we're learning using uh, rewards, whether or not we're learning using supervised labels from a teacher, whether we're just learning through unsupervised uh, immersion in the, the, the sort of the raw data of a subject. Regardless of that, the question is still, can we learn by immersing ourselves in one subject at a time, getting to know that deeply, and then moving on to another subject. Um, another related question is about how, how slow or fast should learning be? How much data is too much, and how much specialization do we need? So for instance, we can learn, of course, on one subject at a time very deeply. Uh, we can do this in particular um, by learning from experience in an environment um, and similarly to, to evolutionary optimization, we can get to a point where we have an extremely good approach to one specific problem. Um, it's slow, it takes a lot of data, but it's a powerful approach. So by example here, I would throw out the cheetah as being very well optimized for what it can do. Um, and uh, on, on, on the other side, I will put forth uh, this lovely humanoid model, which has learned for uh, many, many, uh, many, many days in order to do very well on uh, getting through this parkour environment of jumping over gaps. And it's extremely good at that. It's well optimized. Um, but of course, we know instinctively by looking at it that that's all it can do. 
Um, and this is, this is a powerful tool. If you want to optimize for one thing, if you want an expert, then we know how to do that now. It, takes a, it can take a long time. It takes a lot of data. It takes a lot of experience, but we can do that. On the other side, we've also gotten better uh, in, in uh, and I'm talking here, we in terms of, I'm thinking about uh, machine learning models that learn from experience. Reinforcement learning models, but others as well. Um, so uh, how, how fast should learning be? Well, transfer and generalization are central problems in machine learning, and so this has been studied for a long time. Um, and uh, deep learning approaches are known through at being very good at being able to reuse the future features uh, directly uh, without any additional learning or uh, by applying fine, fine tuning. Um, there's also approaches uh, like meta-learning approaches that have been able to show adaptation in just a few gradient steps on a new problem. Um, and indeed, this is sort of a hallmark of intelligence across species. So for humans, one of the tests that we uh, give, to, give to kids and, and, and students is something like this uh, uh, Raven's Progressive Matrices, where you need to sort of understand what the problem is from a small amount of data and then say, what is the, what is the missing element here? Um, and this is, this is used by us as a way to measure intelligence because we see that uh, application of uh, understanding to a new domain to be very important. And we also, like I said, we use this to judge the intelligence of other species, uh, looking, for instance, at the ability of an octopus to, uh, to take on uh, new things and use them as tools to serve a purpose here, hiding inside of a shell. And in the field of, uh, of, of reinforcement learning, um, we see, for instance, uh, like I said, uh, MAML, which is a meta-learning approach that allows with one gradient step to be able to adapt a, a policy to a different objective. And so these are all impressive examples of uh, fast learning, very fast learning. What I'm primarily interested in is what's left in the middle. We don't want to optimize forever on a single task, and we don't always want to have something that can uh, generalize immediately or do well with a single gradient step. step. So I'm interested in how we can learn expert skills over a lifetime robustly. So learning that requires uh, exploration, um, the building of proficiencies through curricula, um, and composition and transfer of knowledge. Um, so that we could do something like proceed through a curricula of different subjects that are complex, gain that knowledge over time, transfer it, um, um, and, and, and use it. Um, you know, and this works in the field of bodies as well. Humans are good at becoming, for instance, triathlon champions, where they learn to do multiple different things. No human athlete is only doing a single, a single uh, um, um, skill like maybe a cheetah is, although I'm sure I'm selling cheetahs short on this. Cheetahs do many, many things uh, more than just running quickly. All right, so I'm going to change the title of this talk. Uh, based on that digression, to learning as a not too fast, not too slow, definitely non-stationary and non-IID process. And I'm going to talk about three related areas of research, um, uh, somewhat related. Uh, they are different, so I, I will separate them here. So one is continual learning, um, one is multi-objective learning, and one is multi-agent learning. So let's start with continual learning. Um, there's lots of definitions of continual learning. Um, these are is just a sample of papers that have, uh, since the 90s, been throwing out definitions for what continual learning is. Rather than formalizing it, I'm just going to present it as a bit of a laundry list of things that we want, desiderata that we would like to have that we would call a continual learning uh, method or continual learning agent. We'd like to see forward transfer. Given a new task, you should be able to use something, transfer uh, knowledge or skills to be able to do better on a new task. Uh, backwards transfer as well. If I learn something, I would like to be able to go back and use that to do better on something that I have learned previously. Um, no catastrophic forgetting, uh, but we might need to have graceful forgetting. Um, no catastrophic interference. So if I learn something in one context that directly contradicts something else that I learned in another context, I should be able to keep those straight and still learn without having, uh, just uh, um, without collapsing. Um, 
It needs to be scalable. There's a lot of works that, you know, think about continual learning as being a space of uh, 10 tasks, um, or three, or maybe 20, but rarely do we think about what can span a lifetime um, and say a thousand tasks um, without having problems. And uh, handling sort of non clearly labeled different tasks. So we don't want to require that the world is composed of tasks. It would be nice if the world was composed of experience and different skills could be learned from different experience over time. Um, and handling drift. So that's a long list of, of, uh, uh, of, of wants, of desiderata. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, well, first I'm going to show a master class in continual learning. I love this, uh, this, this video. I've seen that Chelsea uh, shows this video as well, Chelsea Finn in her talks and talking about meta-learning. Um, but I just find this to always be remarkable. Uh, it's a single video of a baby um, learning a lot uh, in, in its world through ex exploration and learning on all sorts of different things. So I view this as a bit of a master class in continual learning, not quite achievable yet um, by us. I don't think that there are any robots that would handle this much uh, rolling about and banging into things. We need robots that can heal. Right, so let me present a, a, a work that we did a couple years ago at DeepMind called Progress and Compress. And sorry, in this work, we really tried to um, come up with a notion of a scalable framework that would be able to handle some of the different uh, uh, challenges that I, that I put forward. Um, so the, this method is composed of two phases. The first is a progress phase. So in here, we've got an architecture which is two columns. So these are two uh, neural networks. Um, and they're connected by lateral connections from the activations of each layer into the uh, input of, the, of, of layers here. They don't need to be the same network. They don't need to, to have the same architecture. They could be larger and smaller. Um, and we're going to call this one the knowledge base. And we're going to call this the active column. And we're interested here in reinforcement learning. Uh, we did this work using uh, Atari games. And uh, so that's what I've shown here. And the output is a policy and value function. And in the progress phase, we're going to freeze this network. We're still going to feed the data through it. Every frame goes through here. Um, and the activations uh, come over to this active column. And this is the column that we train. This mean that means that if there's any features in here that are valuable, um, any skills at any level, whether low level, high level, they can be transferred over and reused by this active column that is trying to solve uh, this game, maximize returns on Pac-Man. This is similar to progressive nets, um, which uh, also had these lateral connections and the idea of learning on an active column while keeping previous columns frozen. Uh, the emphasis is on forward transfer, obviously, and there are these lateral connections at every layer. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why we did this rather than simply fine-tuning this is because in reinforcement learning in particular, it can be really useful to have sort of a, a, a freshly initialized network in order to learn on a new game. Uh, but what about scalability? In progressive nets, we just keep on adding on columns forever and ever. That doesn't work very well. It doesn't scale very well. Well, it works well. It doesn't scale. Um, so instead of progressing forward, and when we get to the next task, uh, adding another column, we're going to have a compress phase. And this is basically doing knowledge distillation from that active column either after we've learned uh, the, the task, the game, or while we've done, while we are learning it, and we distill that knowledge back into our knowledge base. Uh, so this is basically using a KL constraint uh, between the outputs um, of the two columns. And this allows us to transfer back the information back into the knowledge base, which will make it available for the next task. So in this case, this one is frozen. This one is active. We're still feeding the same data through both networks. So this gives us uh, knowledge distillation, gives us a convenient uh, supervised learning objective in order to sort of uh, efficiently consolidate that knowledge backwards into the first column. 
Um, and uh, in reinforcement learning, the scale of the distillation we lost does not depend on the scale of the reward scheme, which is also valuable. Um, and this allows backwards transfer. This means that we could uh, do better on previous tasks after we've seen a, a new task. Uh, but what about forgetting? Right? This is the problem here, is that when I distill back here, I have not solved the problem of catastrophic forgetting. And if I do this naively, I will simply wash out whatever was there beforehand. So instead, we add a regularization, a quadratic regularization, onto the distillation objective that basically says stay close to the previous parameters, especially the ones that were important uh, for the previous tasks. Um, and this is EWC, or elastic weight consolidation. Um, and I won't go, uh, and we actually use a different formulation of it, an online formulation of it, so that we don't need to maintain the estimate of the fissure for, previous, for all previous tasks. We simply keep a rolling uh, um, uh, of them. And there are other used in the EWC to modify the prevent forgetting in the, uh, in, in, the knowledge, uh, in the knowledge base in the first column. Uh, but this one works well. So you'll have to imagine this happening over many, many different games. But it's just two phases. We start with these both being initialized randomly. We learn on the first task. Then we compress back into the first network. Now we start learning a second task. We again make a new active randomly initialized column. We learn on that. And then we compress back again. This is a scalable process by which we're always learning on new weights with new tasks. And then we compress them back in and hopefully consolidate that information there. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Consolidate the information into the knowledge base such that we can use it uh, to gain skills over time. Uh, so this handles some of the desiderata, not all of them, uh, but a significant number. So we have forward transfer, we have sca scalability, we have protection against cas catastrophic forgetting, um, and we have backwards transfer. Uh, what we have not necessarily uh, solved here is go back. What we have not necessarily uh, solved here is being able to handle unlabeled task boundaries um, and handling drift. So here we're still assuming that the world consists of distinct specific tasks in the world and that we know where those boundaries are so that we can keep on initializing it. Although I think that there would be ways to turn this into more of a fully uh, online unlabeled uh, process rather than having distinct phases. Uh, so the results of this were, uh, were strong. We looked at this on Omniglot in terms of sequential learning of 50 different alphabets. <coughs> as a way to assess whether or not we had any, uh, any catastrophic forgetting happening. And then we assessed it on a sequence of six Atari games in order to see how well we were handling um, uh, um, forward transfer and sort of building up knowledge over time. Uh, so this is the results for the forward uh, transfer. We compared it against just using EWC alone on a single network. Um, and learning on each of the games, so not having two columns but just one, or just fine-tuning fine a single column um, or using the new online EWC. Um, and that's for, compared to progress and compress, but using uh, active column with re reinitialization of that active column or not. And it does well across all of the, uh, all of the, all of the tasks, the six Atari games. Um, and some learning curves of what that looks like. You see sort of this back and forth as the, um, the, the, the red line learns on the task and then continues to sort of uh, acquire the new knowledge over time. Uh, the next uh, work that I wanted to talk about is in the field of meta-learning, not continual learning, although it can be used for continual learning as well. I have uh, just uh, one experiment that demonstrates that. So the title of this paper is Meta-Learning with Warped Gradient Descent. Um, and let's just start out by looking at some of the different types of meta-learning that's been proposed, learning to learn. 
So there's learning from memory. Uh, for instance, learning to reinforcement learn. Uh, learning to compare, uh, learning by task inference, and learning as optimization, so a gradient-based method. And uh, this, this uh, sits in that area of learning as optimization. So first, let's take a look at MAML, which hopefully uh, some people here might be already familiar with. Uh, MAML is model agnostic meta-learning. And the, the objective here is to learn an initialization uh, such that you get good final performance when you learn on, on an individual task. So learning across a, a distribution of tasks so that you get to a good initialization of your parameters of a network such that you can then learn quickly on, on new tasks. Um, so this treats learning as a function and the objective is to meta-learn over a set of tasks, for instance, one through four here, um, by gradient descent. So that means that we are taking uh, learning on, say, four different tasks at a time, and then we, um, and that would be the inner loop of the algorithm, and then we are backpropping through that inner loop in order to make a uh, to update the um, the initialized uh, parameter theta zero. So the this is a mammal has been a great algorithm and very interesting to the uh, meta-learning community. There are scaling challenges, however. Uh, so there are problems with the metagradients and how do you handle this learning. And unfortunately, it scales quadratically in the length of the trajectory and the parameters. Um, so this means that it rarely works um, and it's hard to scale it beyond about 10 adaptation steps. So that means you can learn on new things you've never seen before, but only if you can learn on them in 10 steps. And that's a pretty hard ask. Um, and I think that that's why we've tended to see that, um, uh, you know, the half cheetah and other very simple environments tend to be what is presented as being the, the key results using this type of algorithm. Uh, they're very simple environments, simple inputs, uh, simple uh, network representations. So the question here was whether we could find a more effective gradient-based meta-learner. Uh, and the insight here is that we can learn to warp the lost surface rather than to find a good init single initialization point. Uh, so gradient descent lives on a lost surface, uh, maybe that looks like that. And rather than changing where we want to start on it, uh, we want to change the surface itself by warping the parameters such that learning becomes more efficient no matter where we start on the surface. And we want to do this by learning a projection, um, and this is equivalent to learning a gradient pre preconditioner, something that's well known in the field of optimization. Um, and uh, it can be done by, uh, we can implement preconditioning via warp layers, which are inserted. And I will say what that, that is. That is not a technical term. That is a term that uh, Sebastian, the uh, first author on this paper, coined. Um, what this looks like is that if we have a task adaptable layer, so this is a regular neural network layer that you would train on a new task and that you would adapt directly to that new task, we're also going to add in an additional non-adaptable warp layer. And this is going to act to um, be trained such that it will precondition the gradients and send a preconditioned gradient to more effectively uh, be able to train on new tasks. And this simply means in practice that we are going to take the, our neural network and every other layer is going to be adaptable for new tasks and every other layer is going to be trained only at the meta level, at the meta gradient level, and it's going to be kept fixed when you adapt to ind individual tasks. So it is doing gradient preconditioning, but only uh, implicitly rather than explicitly. Plus, this means that the, these uh, warp layers, as we call them, that are fixed and non-adaptable, can be, they can be non-linear, they can be whatever, uh, uh, they can be as complex as we would like them to be. This makes this much more effective. Uh, so, uh, again, the, the insight here is that learning a geometry doesn't need to depend on the initialization. Um, it just needs to learn on, uh, it just needs to depend on the search space. So um, what we want to do is to learn to precondition gradients over a search space. Uh, first of all, we need to uh, have a parameter distribution across that space, and we uh, have this through stochastic gradient descent. 
Then we want to meta-learn the, uh, these warp parameters, these fixed warp layers. We want to meta-learn those to yield the steepest directions of descent over the search space. And this allows us to, in fact, not only learn the geometry of a space, uh, ad adapt the geometry of a space, but we can also use this to learn the in initialization as well by combining this, for instance, with MAML, with LEAP, or with other methods that directly learn a good initialization of the parameters. Uh, we can combine <coughs> this warp method inserting these uh, individual layers, like I said, keeping them fixed on individual tasks, and then adapting them with a meta uh, objective function. We can um, combine this with MAML and show that we are uh, competitive on the few shot tasks, such as mini image net and tiered image net, and can do substantially better than MAML alone. Uh, but with then we can also scale beyond MAML-based learners and we can show that this can do well in the space of 100 gradient steps, 100 steps of adaptation. So we don't want to just be able to learn very quickly. We want to be able to learn at 1,000 steps, 100 steps, uh, however much we'd like. We'd still be able to like to take advantage of that individual training on different, on different, um, on different tasks. And so this can't be compared to MAML because MAML doesn't scale to this, but we can compare it to LEAP, uh, to Reptile, to simply fine tuning, or to simply improving our optimization method, for instance, by using KFAC. Um, and uh, so KFAC is presented here as, these, uh, as the, 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 the dotted lines. And then we're looking at, given a different number of tasks in the meta training set, uh, how well we can do on the held out tasks. Uh, and this is uh, over, uh, believe this is over Omniglot, uh, but Omniglot trained on 100 steps rather than simply 10. And the uh, warp leaf does significantly better, uh, pretty much no matter how many tasks you have to use in the meta training set. Uh, we can also handle reinforcement learning and more complex architectures and problems. Uh, so here we're using a hyper network representation as the war players uh, using uh, A2C uh, uh, recurrent agent and doing maze navigation. So this is over different random mazes and a lot of methods uh, struggle with this, with having a good performance on new uh, new tasks, being new mazes with new uh, reward, new goal locations, um, and the warp uh, adding in these warp layers and that meta objective does substantially better than other methods. And lastly, we can use warp grad, uh, as we call it, to learn to continually learn. So this was a pretty small experiment was, which was done, uh, where the task was to do well across a set of subtasks. So here you take a bunch of small tasks, um, I think these are just sign regressions, and every inner loop now consists of five different tasks which are trained sequentially with the same parameters. So in this case you can keep on forgetting as you go through these tasks if you don't do anything. But here the outer loop meta objective optimizes for the expected accuracy across all of those five tasks. Um, and the result is that the network not only learns to not forget as it goes sees a new sequence of tasks, um, but it does it in an interesting way. It learns to um, uh, partition and share different parts of its uh, parameter space in order to share resources as necessary or to uh, disentangle things that might pot potentially conflict. So rather than all of the various methods for continual learning, where we as algorithm designers are saying, this is how you prevent catastrophic forgetting. Instead here, it's the algorithm itself that is figuring that out, how it can learn to continually learn over sets of tasks sequentially. All right. The next area I want to talk about is multi-objective learning. Um, and the context here, we started looking at multi-objective learning from a very practical point of view. So if you train a robot or a model of the robot, in this case, this is a model of a little quadruped called the Minotaur. And if you train it for locomotion, then it can be pretty simple. You just say that there is a reward 
that's based on velocity in a desired direction. Um, unfortunately, when you apply this on a complex uh, model even of, of a robot like this, then what you can get is some very uh, um, unappealing behavior where it is managing to get a positive reward there uh, and actually it can, it can get to cartwheeling very quickly through the environment. But this isn't something that will work at all. Um, and, and so a lot of the solutions that we can learn using these simple reward objectives are not actually suitable for any real robot um, with limited autonomy. So we can see this in uh, this humanoid figure again. Uh, so this humanoid is learning to solve this task, even though this is not related to a real robot body, it's still clear to see that it is managing to do well on this task and maximize uh, returns by extending every joint with maximum velocity to its maximum extent. If there was a robot, it would be broken. Um, it would not be able to do this. There's also obviously here the problem of, of power output, of being more efficient with, with use of, of energy. And we can do something like just look under the hood at something like a cart pole. Now this looks like a great solution. The cart pole is perfectly balanced. It gets a perfect score. But if you look under the hood, that's the actions that it's taking. And they're all maximized out. So the solution that is learned is bang bang control. Even when the cart pole is being perfectly balanced, it's sending a single signal that is maximum uh, torques or velocity in either direction back and forth. So this is not a useful solution for us. Um, the natural thing to do, and I think probably the right thing to do, is to add additional objectives to improve the safety. We can add penalties. We can add a, 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 a cost on control or energy usage. Um, Here's one more example, uh, and this is not to do with, uh, th this is more to do with safety. So when we don't have any way to control the forces that are used, then we could end up just causing damage. Um, so again, we want to be able to add additional objectives to say, learn to stack the Duplos, but do it in such a way that no, no Duplo is harmed uh, in the process. This is easier said than done. Um, so usually RL optimizes for a single scalar reward, but we would like to way, have a way uh, to bring in multiple different objectives. Um, and this can be tricky to get right. Um, it's not that there aren't good methods out there, but there are a lot, there are a lot of, of uh, um, there aren't, uh, I'd say, the right solution yet. Um, so for instance, here uh, we've trained the, uh, a model of the animal robot in order to walk but only by using six different component costs there and carefully balancing those in order to make it, it look good. Um, and of course, that limits the expressivity of what that can learn. Uh, there's gentle manipulation, which balances out positive and negative costs along with intrinsic, motion, uh, intrinsic motivation uh, uh, rewards in order to keep the learning uh, from becoming degenerate altogether. Um, and this is also trying to optimize for the minotaur locomotion. So instead, we look at the field of constrained optimization uh, for a solution. And the intuition here quickly is that we can assume that in these sorts of environments that as task reward increases, that there's some cost that's increasing as well. And we can just take a linear combination um, of the positive task reward and the negative cost. But of course, there's uh, you know, different ways to do this. This is the problem of reward tuning. Um, instead, we can say, uh, let's fix, set an upper bound on what the cost can be, and then we're going to try to maximize task reward up until that constraint. Uh, or we can consider the reverse, uh, which, is, which is what we've done, which is to put a lower bound on the task reward and then try to minimize the cost. Now, this still involves having fixed, uh, fixed values here of saying what I, want that minimal, uh, what I want that minimal reward to be or what I want that maximum cost to be. Um, so uh, instead, we use an, uh, uh, so this can be, we can optimize this by taking our hard constraints and relaxing them 
um, by using a Lagrangian multiplier and solving the, 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 the dual here. And this allows us to actually learn those multipliers um, alongside the value estimates directly in the critic. Um, and if you use an LSTM to represent the state in the critic, then you can get a much more um, robust learning process that can quickly learn to uh, get to a good behavior even while it is trying to minimize costs, maximize those, uh, the task rewards. Um, in practice, this, what this means is that the robot has to first satisfy the criteria of starting to move forward, getting some, some forward velocity, and then it quickly has to learn to minimize costs. But since we're always managing to keep uh, some uh, positive reward in the environment, then it's a very fast learning process that we can now measure in terms of uh, two hours rather than, and that's on robot time, two hours on the robot of learning uh, to get to a reasonable gait rather than a much longer process that might be uh, you know, a week of things oscillating back and forth. And these sorts of constraints can be used in other environments as well. Uh, we just tried using this for uh, a visibility constraint where basically the robot has been trained that it needs to meet, uh, it needs to reach that block towards a particular location, but only while you can still see a corner on the block, which is a very silly sort of contrived situation. But still, we just wanted a way to understand if this could be used outside of the realm of, of safety and sort of these, uh, these continuous cost functions into something that was just a, uh, a binary visibility function. And uh, one other approach that I wanted to mention in the area of multi-objective learning is uh, something that we call uh, Scheduled Auxiliary Control, SACX. I think that differentiates it from Soft Actor Critic. Uh, and the name of the paper is Learning by Playing. And um, the intuition here is that if you really don't know what the real goal is, um, just do other stuff while you're trying to figure it out. Let everybody enjoy, and, and enjoy the baby for a moment. <laughs> My cat would not tolerate this. Right. So the problem is of how do we learn efficiently if we only have a sparse reward? So if we want to do something really hard, I mean, we all know anybody who does reinforcement learning understands the problem of learning with a sparse reward. There's some goal. We don't know how to get there. What do we do in the meantime? How do we efficiently explore? Um, and human play involves activating their senses deliberately. Uh, this baby here and also the, the, the other baby in the other video were activating their senses uh, deliberately, doing lots of things. And then on the way, they discover other interesting things. Uh, so in the same case, we would like to have that the robots uh, deliberately activate different sorts of skills that they have through touching things, moving things, arranging things, and then maybe they figure out what the goal is. Um, so we compute a, or we generate a reward vector in this case, which is a combination of extrinsic uh, um, intentions or reward functions, intrinsic ones, and auxiliary ones, meaning tasks that are not the actual problem that we want to solve, but are related. And these may be things that it's easy to compute, um, uh, especially on the real robot. Execute all of the attentions during, intentions during learning by sam sampling from them uh, for every episode, and then put all of the data into transition memory and share the transitions and learn over all of it at once. Um, and this is related to hindsight experience replay, uh, which really speeds things up. Um, so an example is that we have the final goal here of wanting to take these two blocks and clean them up, put them in the box. So this is something that will never be learned by the robot um, and never be learned in simulation either uh, using uh, any other type of exploration, I would argue. Um, what we do is add some other auxiliary loss functions and also intrinsic reward functions, learning to put objects to the left and right of each other, learn to touch them, learn to pick them up, learn to stack them. This allows a quite scalable process towards learning the final, towards learning to the final goal. And the SAC 
Q here refers to using uh, Q learning at a, uh, at a data level to choose which data to save and which data to learn from over time. Um, this works well, it works well on pixels, works well on the real robot as well. All right, the last part of this that I wanted to talk about was multi-agent learning. So multi-agent learning, uh, uh, somebody recently described this to me as, uh, with, with a certain sense of annoyance at that this works so well, but, it, but it's unreasonably effective how well it works to use self-play or to use multi-agent play in order to solve a problem, but more than to solve a problem, to automatically scale the complexity and to have a, a stable way of having different behaviors emerge over time. It's a very non-stationary learning process because here we've got at least two different agents that are operating together over time and they are each discovering different policies over time, maybe discovering different, different behaviors and then discarding them over time. So it becomes, the, it is a non-stationary learning process that is somehow still stable because the agents are responding to each other and then continuing to uh, build on these skills against each other. Um, and the most common way in which multi-agent learning has worked well at scale that we've seen has been competitive environments. But there's also ways to phrase this as collaborative uh, environments or imitative learning environments, for instance, where one agent sets, uh, sets a task or sets a goal, another agent tries to solve it, or where one agent tries to demonstrate something and another agent tries to imitate it. Uh, then the agent can try to demonstrate something new. Can you do this? Can you do this? And it's a matter of coming up with both generative behaviors and also robust uh, imitation behaviors over time. But I'm gonna focus more on competitive learning environments. Uh, so obviously our work started with, uh, with Go, and this was sort of the first example, at least that we saw at DeepMind, of having a uh, multi-agent learning environment that was unreasonably effective. Um, and that did uh, extremely well, even when we took this to the point of alpha zero, where the, um, or the, um, well, or later work as well, but for alpha zero, where the agents start knowing nothing about how to play the game, they're just simply making random moves, and still they manage to get from that, from a base of having uh, no domain knowledge, all the way to superhuman uh, level play at Go. So this was a success story. And the question was after that, well, what else can we do? Um, how can we do in, more, in other types of environments that stress this paradigm in different ways? Uh, so I'll just talk for a minute about Capture the Flag. Uh, Capture the Flag, or the, the title of the paper that's been published on this is Human Level Performance in 3D Multiplayer Games with Population-Based Reinforcement Learning. Um, so here what the, the challenge was not just self-play between two agents, um, in a perfect information game, uh, but multiplayer games where you have teams of, of 2v2 uh, or 4v4 and being able to train all of those agents um, and then looking at the results of what we get. So this was a fairly large effort at DeepMind. I'll start, start by showing you what Capture the Flag is because mm, probably not everybody knows what, uh, what we mean by that. Uh, so the goal is to get to the enemy's gate, uh, the enemy's base, pick up the flag, and bring it back to your base. You get a point if you get your flag back at your base. Um, and you can tag uh, other opponent flag carriers in order to get your flag back. And obviously, the, t the other side is doing the same thing. So it's the red and the blue team. Um, and then you keep on, you keep on playing. Um, and I should point out that this is just here for our benefit, this sort of view of it. This is the only thing that the agent ever sees, is that layer, is that uh, RGB input. So the first thing to do here was to build environments. Um, and after a few experiments on training within very simple, a single environment, so just looking at one small maze, 
then we decided that that really did not work well. It didn't provide enough richness in the environment to get this process that we wanted started of learning back and forth and uh, building up these expertise and different behaviors over time and differentiating between a population of agents, which is what we were looking for. Um, so. Um, uh, the, the, the DeepMind group that worked on this, led by Max Yatterberg, uh, built a, a procedural environment, two different ones. So one of them is an outdoor environment and one of them is indoor. They're both procedural. They're, they all have the same size to them, but they can have a lot of different complexity in terms of the obstacles um, and the different layouts that you get from this. Um, and in any case, the rules are the same. There's a red base, there's a blue base, there's red flags, blue flags, and the avatars that are operating have the same um, control space that they're, that they're using. Uh, but everything sort of looks different in, in the hilly space. You can slide down hills and things like this. Um, the agent architecture that worked best is a temporal hierarchy. Uh, so this was a really nice example of showing that uh, using uh, temporal hierarchies could work better than using uh, a flat or a fast uh, temporal agent. So the idea here is that over time you're going to get the sequence of observations in the environment. And we're going to have just two levels of this hierarchy. One of them is a, and, and they're both RNNs, one of them is fast. It sees every observation as it comes in. And the other one ticks slowly. Um, at, a, at a fixed rate, although there's been some work on making that adaptive as well. But right now, this, this operates at a fixed rate, and that's also an, uh, an, an LSTM. Um, and they both have shared, they have an external learned memory, uh, the DNC. Um, and the way in this, which this works is we want to have the slower RNN learn to do planning and learning to do more abstract reasoning over the space of the game, which we think and we believe will never happen at the space of this fast RNN that's needing to uh, produce an action and, and process an observation at every step. So the slower RNN runs, the fast RNN runs, and then they, um, they, both use a, they both have a probabilistic latent variable, and there is a KL loss between these latents. Uh, this means that the slow time scale is predicting the fast time scale, and the fast time scale has to stick close to the predictions made at the slow time scale. And while there's no direct, there's nothing direct in here that directly does, for instance, model-based planning. There's nothing in here that forces the memory to be used in any particular way. There's nothing in here at all except for having the reward that's coming in and the different agents using the structure. Then what we see is that we see the use of memory, the use of planning, and the use of consistent action uh, sequences uh, rather than simply greedy policies emerging from the, from the agents. The other aspect of this that's important beyond the, that uh, architecture, that learning architecture for each agent um, is uh, a population. So we use a population of agents. There's individual stream of experience that's sent back uh, from every agent that's playing. Um, so the, the, there is a number of agents that's drawn uh, randomly from the population for each episode. Um, and every agent in the population is uh, kept different, diverse. And each agent trains with independent uh, reinforcement learning, independent actions, and without any global, um, any global information. So it's just as if you had a, a population of players, and they're just always being asked, now play this role, now start here, now, now be on the red team, now be on the blue team, uh, but learn yourself um, so, so that they all become different over time. The, uh, oh, I will. The uh, use of the population is also useful, uh, helpful for another way, uh, beyond maintaining diversity across this group. It also allows us to do meta-optimization of the hyperparameters. So hyperparameters are adapted through having, um, over time, we choose the hyperparameters that works, work best in this agent population, and we phase out ones that don't do well, and we spawn new ones with uh, hyperparameters that, that uh, result in faster learning. And so over time, you can see uh, the, the uh, tree of hyperparameters being explored. And you can also see that the agent population overall gets better than, uh, than human players. I 
And I won't play this for too long because I've found that it really takes staring at it for a long time to be able to sort of parse what all is going on. Uh, but we did a lot of analysis on this in order to say, uh, figure out what are the different characteristics that are coming out, uh, what are the different sort of strategies that, that are here. And there are very clear strategies like uh, you always get an agent that says, okay, I'm just going to guard the base. And they just stay there and they just guard the base. That's all that they do. They haven't you know, decided that and in, other, and in other episodes they might take a different role. But there is this distribution of responsibility across the different uh, players such that they do different things. Guarding the base, going and camping outside of the opponent's base, um, or, or running back and forth or just trying to tag everything that's seen. So really quite interesting, the analysis here. What we didn't see as much was a strong need for navigation. So one of the hypotheses was that you would need to solve navigation. Um, in other words, knowing from this first person view where you are um, in sort of an internal map sense. We didn't actually see a lot of evidence of that um, in the same way that humans seem to have that. Uh, I would hypothesize that training on different sizes and types, a lot more broader environments, might, uh, we might see that more. And lastly, the uh, evaluation that was done with this uh, project was, was quite fun. Uh, so we brought in first DeepMind players and then external players uh, to come and play tournaments. Uh, the humans played tournaments against each other. They also played tournaments against agents. And they also partnered with agents uh, in order to play. Uh, so the agents are better than humans. And humans win against the agents if they're playing with an agent teammate. And the most interesting, humans like playing with the agents better than they like playing with the other humans. <laughs> At least they rated the agent as the most collaborative. And they liked winning, I guess, so <laughs> you'd want to be ranked with them. And this was, uh, this was blind, so they didn't know at any point whether or not their teammate was, was an agent from the population or was, uh, or, or was another human. I'm quickly running out of time, but I wanted to touch on StarCraft as well. So uh, StarCraft is, um, um, well, AlphaStar is a project that we've been doing for not that long, not anywhere near as long as uh, AlphaGo, for instance. And uh, we sh demonstrated that we had agents that uh, could achieve Grandmaster level in StarCraft II uh, using, again, multi-agent reinforcement learning. An even longer list of, <laughs> of authors. Um, so board games are great, but they have perfect information and they have simple state transitions. StarCraft II has very in imperfect information uh, coming from the fact that you can only see part of the board and then there's even the a fog of war effect, uh, so you really can't see a lot. It requires long-term planning. The games are very long up to about 5,000 steps. It's real time, so we need to deal with the, uh, the world changing um, w b between um, observations. And the, obs the action space is uh, gigantic. Uh, so the game objectives, if you've never played StarCraft, um, is to collect resources, build a base, build units, and defeat the opponent. Uh, there's no actual borders between these different things. This is just the general process of how, how a, a game goes. And the AlphaStar uh, architecture uh, looks in some ways similar to all the other architectures <laughs> that, that we've built. Um, I'd say that an interesting thing is that there's the use of a transformer here uh, in order to have a, a sort of a relational structure Re relational reasoning structure um, across the different units. So you're controlling a lot of different units um, at a time. And so this transformer, which uses attention, was used to uh, 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 allow attention across these different units and worked well. Feed forward network, uh, ResNet, all combined together in a deep LSTM. Uh, I think a fairly deep LSTM. Um, and then outputting actions. And this also uses a uh, population structure. Um, in fact, here we formalize that a little bit more into a league. So we start with supervised data. We have not yet been able to show that you can start from, from zero knowledge, that you can start tabula rasa uh, in StarCraft and do well. So what we do is start with about 3,000 games of expert play and start to train agents. 
um, those agents that do well enter the Alpha Star League um, and judge, as judged by their self play against others. And they play against each other. And they continue to learn and to get better. And then we ad advance, we, uh, um, we spawn duplicates that go on to the next layer of the, the league. So with some changes, but largely keeping um, a similar, uh, similar objectives for each agent, um, similar hyperparameters, et cetera. But we spawn, we copy new ones and allow them to keep on evolving. Agents that are trained at this next layer of the, the league play against each other to continue to advance their skills, but they also always continue to play against all of the previous ones, including the ones that were trained directly on human play using supervised learning. And this allows us to make sure that the, that the agents don't just start um, um, sort of devolving or, or di digressing into uh, small aspects of the game. And eventually, we get to a point where we have uh, agents that are extremely good and they're extremely robust, uh, meaning that they can't be uh, taken advantage of by any of the previous agents that have gone so far. They have, uh, they have strategies which are not exploitable. Um, and then we choose an agent from there. Um, we make sure that we have a diversity in this league. It's important to make sure that the agents, that there's enough diversity in the population. So we start by having different, uh, uh, the, the agents are able to select from different reward functions that they get, as in they can choose to get a cookie every time that they make a dark Templar. Um, and that will proceed throughout the game. So they get, they get points for winning the game, winning the match, but they also get a small cookie, a small reward every time they build a particular different uh, unit, for instance. And there's other types of strategies. And these can change over time, and they're selected sort of by the agents um, as they progress through the leagues. Um, so we evaluated this against two players who were nice enough to play against us, TLO and MANA. MANA is uh, one of the top, top 10 in the world. Uh, StarCraft players, so it was uh, really fun to have them try to exploit our agents. And uh, this is how they rank. So StarCraft Blizzard uses uh, this sort of uh, ranking uh, system, uh, matchmaking. I've forgotten what, it, what, what, what this is. Our supervised learning agent starts out here when it's just learned from human play. You can do very well, uh, but you can't get up to the level of the experts and the grandmasters. Um, and our agents, we believe, are up at this level and have been able to consistently beat both uh, MANA and TLO. Um, and the result was that there was uh, that of the official game match was that AlphaStar won 10 games and lost one. Um, and I think there's been a lot of results since then. I actually haven't followed it since this. I was involved up until this point. Um, but I think that people have been having a lot of fun playing directly against the agents that have been out uh, available to play. Anyway, that's all I had to talk about. That's the list of all of the different papers that I talked about. And happy to take your questions now. Thank you. Yes. So I can repeat the question. The question is wh whether the warp grad um, approach can be used for. Like for um, any uh, deep learning network training. I mean, uh, it, it assumes. Or it's just for, I forgot, it was for continual learning or for. For meta learning. Uh, for, for meta learning. Yeah, okay. for being able to adapt more quickly to new tasks that are seen. Um, it could certainly be. Uh, if, if you have a learning approach where you would want to have this um, secondary level of um, uh, sort of meta level optimization of the network, then you could. The question is what data you do that on. Uh, but I could imagine that you could take just a, a batch, for instance, of supervised learning data, learn across that, and then adapt these fixed layers um, over time. And that might yield a... Uh, a a network that was better able to generalize, it would act as a regularizer um, to, to, to the network. So it might work better than for fine tuning, uh, for instance. 
I mean, I think that the same architecture could be used, and the same loss function could, could be used, and uh, just in a different, not in a meta-learning paradigm, but just in a uh, more traditional paradigm. So. Yep. Yes. Oh. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, for your presentation. And uh, my question is that um, uh, I noticed that some uh, progress in DeepMind just uh, just combined uh, model-free deep reinforcement learning with a uh, uh, pre-trained model. Uh, could you talk uh, t talk about some progress about the model-based uh, reinforcement learning? Um, oh, I guess get that. Yeah. You're saying that mostly the Progress has been in model-free. Um, yeah, just to combine the model, uh, model-free learning with uh, just a, a model for that. It's called uh, in the domain of model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, trying to think of any specific uh, examples at DeepMind. We've certainly been looking at more model-based learning uh, for doing simtereal adaptation, for instance, with robotics. Uh, when we want to be able to uh, learn the dynamics uh, from data and then keep the and then use those for planning, um, I think that model-based RL still has a ways to go. Um, there's been sort of a long-standing competition, I would say, at DeepMind uh, between model-free RL uh, folks and model-based RL folks. Um, I think that still model-free is, is, is winning, um, but I think that model-based RL has a lot of applications, especially if you want to be more data efficient, for instance. Um, so that's why we're looking at it for robotics. Uh, I don't have any other specific. There's also uh, models like what uh, Don Virstra has been working on, um, his group with um, imagination, with, which, with having generative models embedded in the, in, in the network. Uh, which is implicit, um, I guess, model-based RL. So. Okay, thank you. Yep. Before we take the next question, we will, we will just give a present to Raya, so we have a small present for you at the plaquette. So thank you. So you remember <laughs> us, so she can make a photo together. Yeah. With, uh, maybe in front of the yeah, yeah, right. <laughs>